When we were growing up, we were told that dinosaurs were gigantic animals that had tiny little brains. That's probably why they died out, am I right? So superior we are. We equate larger brains with larger intelligence, and in general, larger animals have larger brains. So it doesn't quite work out. I mean, elephants are pretty smart, but they're not as smart as we are. So then you say, okay, so you factor in the size of the brain as a percentage of total body weight and apply some averages, and sure enough, humans come out on top, followed by dolphins and then chimpanzees. There's actually a name for this. It's called the encephalization quotient. But this idea is put to the test in cases of hydrocephalus, which is a condition where fluid builds up in the ventricles of the brain, often called water on the brain. In many of these cases, the patient was perfectly functional and showed no loss of intelligence whatsoever, even though a huge portion of their brain was literally just water. In some cases, up to 90%, just gone. So how much of your brain do you actually need? On the surface, this is just a, you know, simple medical mystery, interesting, weird facts about people story, which is fun, and there's nothing wrong with that, but really, this gets a lot deeper. It starts to really make you question how our brains work. This whole thing was first brought up and discussed in a case study by Dr. John Lorber in 1980, where he talked about a patient that came in, and he was one of these people that was missing a giant part of his brain, and it was all just water, but he was still behaving perfectly normal. He began to question exactly how much of our brain we actually need to work, and what parts of the brain actually work to control our cognition and our memory and our thought processes. This was disputed by a large number of uh, the scientific community, but eventually, it did bear out. It's easy to see how people wouldn't believe some of the claims that he was making. But another similar case happened in 2007 when a 44-year-old man from France went to his doctor complaining of weakness in his leg. So he got examined. Part of the examination was they did a head x-ray and they found out that he was one of these cases. 90% of his brain was just water. When he was first born, he had water on the brain, this hydrocephaly. And, and basically what that is, is you have these ventricles in your brain, these kind of empty spaces that, um, in cases of hydrocephaly, there's a, a fluid leak and it just kind of builds up in there. So what they did when he was six months old was they put a shunt in there to keep the fluid from uh, accumulating inside the brain, but then when he was 14 years old, they removed it. And apparently they should not have done that. Because unknown to them, this fluid began to accumulate again and it did so for another 30 years. So slowly over 30 years, these ventricles in his brain expanded and expanded and it pushed the white matter, which is the matter inside the brain, not the gray matter, which is on the outside of the brain, but it pushed that to the edges and just created these bigger and bigger cavities inside the brain. Now something that needs to be pointed out is it wasn't like eating up the inside of his brain. All that white matter was still there. It was just smushed up against the gray matter around the skull. And yeah, despite all that, he behaved perfectly normally. He had a slightly below average IQ, but nothing to be alarmed about. Stories like this prompted Dr. James Forsdyke to put out a fairly sensationalistic paper that basically tried to argue that um, in cases like this, it's impossible for the brain to have enough matter to be able to actually contain all of its memories and contain all of its processing that it is able to do, which leads to some conclusions regarding things like subatomic processing, at this you know, uh, quantum level in the brain and also the idea of uh, outside the brain consciousness, sort of like a cloud computing scenario. These are pretty metaphysical constructs and it resembles some of the ORC-OR theory that's uh, been presented by uh, Stuart Hameroff and Roger Penrose, which is really interesting th stuff to think about, um, but it's far from proven. But what we're starting to understand is that the vast majority of processing and memory and just function of the body actually occurs on the outside, on the surface of the brain. And it turns out that the white matter on the inside of the brain, which actually makes up the majority of the brain, uh, is mostly just connective tissue and neurons basically connecting different modules of the brain together. So going back to what I was talking about at the beginning, what really determines intelligence in a species has less to do with the size of the brain and more to do with the surface area. And that's why our brains are more wrinkled. It creates more surface area to be able to do more work. So by that logic, an animal with more folds in its brain would be smarter, right? Enter the koala. The koala kind of proves both of these theories right because it simultaneously has no wrinkles on its brain, its brain is completely smooth, and it is the smallest brain to mass ratio of any mammal. And it is phenomenally dumb. Koalas are so dumb they only eat one food, that's eucalyptus, eucalyptus leaves, that's all they eat. And there's almost no nutrients in eucalyptus, so they have to eat it all day long. As if that wasn't bad enough, 
they will only eat eucalyptus leaves off of the tree. If you take a eucalyptus leaf and put it on the ground, they are too stupid to realize that that is a eucalyptus leaf that they can eat because they only associate it with being on a tree. They're also incredibly temperamental and the babies eat the parents' poop as food. They're just ridiculous, ridiculous animals. Now, if you're Australian, don't take this personally. This isn't about Australia, it's just about the koalas. And I'm not even hating on koalas. They've survived all this time, so clearly something is working. They're just, they're just really, really dumb. So it's a fascinating thing to look at, the idea that we can literally live without 90% of our brains, but I do wanna make sure and point out that uh, it's not like if you just went into your brain with a metal baller and took out 90% of it that you would still be okay. That's not how this works. Again, in the case of the guy that I was talking about earlier, this took place over 30 years, very slowly growing into the position that it was. So it's really more of a testament to the brain's ability to adapt. Neuroplasticity for the win. Thanks for watching, you guys. As always, t-shirts like this one and this one are available at the store, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. This is a partnership with sfsf.com, which is run by a guy named Michael in Prague. He's a brilliant designer. He comes up with all kinds of cool, fun, nerdy uh, t-shirts. There's dozens of them on there, so you can go check them out, uh, answerswithjoe.com slash shirts. Big thanks to the Patreon supporters who keep this channel going. If you would like to join them and get access to cool perks and behind the scenes stuff that nobody else gets to see, it's patreon.com slash answers with Joe. All right, like and share this video if you like it. If this is your first time here, please check out some of my other videos on similar fun random topics. And if you like those, uh, do subscribe because I come back with videos every Thursday and every Monday. All right, you guys have an eye-opening rest of the week and I'll see you on Monday. Love you guys, take care.